You're live. Okay. We're live. Welcome. Thank you for uh, attending MMS 2013, and especially thank you for attending our session today. Configuration Manager 2012, Service Pack 1, and PowerShell, truly better together. Part of our goal today is going to be to show you that. My name is Greg Ramsey. I'm a Config Manager MVP. I work at Dell. Actually, I'm not a Config Manager MVP anymore, am I? What am I, Kaido? Uh, we both are Enterprise Client man Management MVPs yes. to starting from today. Officially, Enterprise Client Management MVPs today. Yep. So go ahead, Kaido, introduce yourself. My name is Kaido Aramets, and I'm from Estonia. And I'm working for a company called Cortec. Great. Yep. Let's get started. Very brief agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some scripting history. Obviously, Configuration Manager, SP1, and PowerShell, and demos. We've got a lot of demos, so pray to the demo, guard, demo gods. No internet access required for our demos today, so I think we're in good shape. Uh, as we mentioned, please save all questions for the end. I got to laugh. That's good. OK, a little bit about uh, scripting, Configuration Manager, scripting history. Before Configuration Manager 2012 Service Pack 1, we needed to use only WVMI to simplify to automate uh, different thi things using VB scripts, PowerShell, or C sub, and creating uh, custom scripts for configura configuration manager may take a lot of time because first we need to write it, then we need to test it, and then we need to verify that it doesn't broke anything. And uh, starting from Service Pack 1, we now have officially PowerShell support, and Service Pack 1 contains uh, 471 different commandlets. And just two weeks ago, Greg? A couple weeks ago? Yep. Microsoft just released uh, Cumulative Update 1 for Service Pack 1. And Cumulative Update 1 added uh, 40 new commandlets. And now we have totally 1,675 different parameter sets. It's a lot of parameters. Yeah. And currently, we don't have 100% uh, match between the user interface and the commandlets. For example, we can't create uh, 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 console, admin console folders, or we can't add, for example, uh, maintenance windows for the collections. Right. There's yeah. cer certain things we'll talk about a little bit later. We, we still have to leverage WMI uh, on occasion. It all depends on what you're looking to do. Just a show of hands, who's using VBScript in Configuration Manager today? Great. Okay. Who's using PowerShell Configuration Manager? Good. Good to see. How many are on... Uh, SMS 2007, or Configuration Manager 2007. Okay, great. Okay, and Configuration Manager PowerShell module only works with 32-bit uh, Windows, Windows PowerShell, and if you're still using a Windows Server 2008 or R2, then you, uh, then you need to install also Windows Management uh, Framework 3.0 also. And... Uh, Configuration Manager PowerShell module is uh, digitally signed, so if you start the Configuration Manager PowerShell uh, session through Admin Console, then it also imports the digital certificate automati automatically. But if you do it from PowerShell IC, then you need, uh, then you need, uh, if you do it und under another account, for example, uh, local system account, or you have a specific, specific service account, then you need to import the certificate to that uh, user account uh, certificate store. Great. Um, a couple of the things to mention here, uh, as Kaido was saying, 32-bit PowerShell. So the Configuration Manager Admin Console is in 32-bit as well. So if you launch it, as Kaido will demonstrate in a little bit, from the, the uh, Admin Console, you're in good shape. If you, if you launch it from a, a standalone PowerShell uh, session, just keep that in mind. Uh, you, if you import that module or attempt to, you're going to have some challenges. Uh, if you just start running command lines, it's important to get into a 32-bit environment first. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently, we have two options to start the Configuration Manager PowerShell session. We can do it through the Admin Console, or we can uh, directly from PowerShell Console. By default, the module is located uh, under the Admin Console bin folder, and the module file name is configuration manager.pst1 and uh, if you install the admin console to your uh, site server or management server then it also creates an environment variable called sms admin U ui path this environment variable gives you a little bit of flexibility 
you know, in both of keeps. At this point, we don't have to care as much where the console is actually installed, as long as you've got this variable. Yep. It's easy for you to, uh, to script out launching. Uh, and a lot of people actually create a shortcut on their desktop that'll, that'll embed this and launch it as well. Yep. So you don't need to hard code this. Right. So, uh, driver letter in your script, so. Makes it a lot easier to share. Okay, let's look at our first demo. I have already opened the uh, uh, admin console, and in the upper left corner, we have this uh, blue rectangle. And uh, if you click it, then you will see below here, connect via Windows PowerShell. Let's click that one. And it will open up the 32-bit Windows PowerShell console. And it will take a moment to import the module. And if you see the prompt with your site code, then the module import was uh, successful. So as you can see here, my site code is peer 2 Kind of what happens if you have more than one, uh, one primary? Will it automatically launch to the, the, the console you have open? Yeah, I think it will. If, if you launch it from a command prompt, though, you'll actually have more than one drive, right? Yep. Okay. I will show it uh, later. Okay. Actually, behind the user interface, it uh, runs this command. So, and you can easily take the command and create the sort card, for example, uh, uh, on your desktop. And you can execute directly from your desktop if you want. So it's uh, really, really easy. The second option is to start the configuration manager browser session from PowerShell IC. And I have here three different uh, examples. And uh, in, in, in example two and in example three, I'm using the environment variable to import the module. For example, let's take the second one. Module is imported. Okay, let's try to get uh, a new package. And the command fails. Greg, why it fails? Uh, because this command cannot be run from the current drive. Yep. So how do we fix that? Actually, uh, Configuration Manager PowerShell module contains also PowerShell provider. And you need to execute all the commands inside the uh, CM site PowerShell provider. You can use CD command or set, set location. I will take the second one. Let's execute this one. And let's try to execute the new CM package commandlet again. And now it works. So let's take, check the console. And I should have one package, 7 CPR. Yep. Success. Great. Helps if I push the right button. <laughs> OK, let's talk a little bit about collections. Yep. Let's take a closer look what we can actually do with these built-in commandlets. For the collections, we have actually two, com two commandlets, one for device collections and one for user collections. Uh, device collections, we have a new CM device collection commandlet, and uh, user collections, we have new CM user collection commandlet. The first example in here gets a very simple col uh, collection without uh, any refresh schedule, uh, so any, no any special settings. The second one, creates a collection with a refresh schedule. So if you want to add a refresh schedule to your collection, then you need to use first new CM schedule commandlet, and then you can pass this object to refresh schedule parameter. Uh, for the, uh, currently we have uh, four different uh, commandlets for the collection rules. Right. So there's a few different types of collection membership rules you can create, right? There's uh, directs and there's query based. We're all familiar with those from even previous versions of Configuration Manager. And then you also have exclude and include membership rules as well. If you're not familiar with those yet, that allows you to include or exclude other collections. So uh, pretty powerful in what you can do there. 
Let's see. Anything there? On, anything else on collections? Nope. Let's go so, to demo. Yep. Let's create a few collections. So. Okay. Let's create uh, one device co device collection. First, I need to import the power cell module. Then I need to change the connection context to my CM site. And then I can execute the last line, new CM device collection. So let's execute the code. And let's see. It should. OK. Now I have one collection, MMS 2013. So it's a simple collection without any uh, special settings. I don't have any refresh schedule here or nothing. So let's create a collection with the refresh schedule. So first we need to create the refresh schedule object and then we can use this object in our second command lab. So let's execute this one. And now I, yep, now I have a second collection with refresh schedule. Yep. But if you want to add, for example, a lot of collections, then you can describe all your collections in CSV file and you can use import CSV commandlet to import the uh, collections information. Then we need to change the co uh, connection context and then we can use a for, for each statement to, to go through all the, the collections that we have in CSV file. So if I execute the com this code, uh, uh, okay. Let's check the admin console. And now I have 10 new collections. And you can do vice versa also. You can query the, all the collections with the get CM device collection commandlet. And you can export this uh, information to CSV file and import, for example, another environment. It's one way you could migrate yep. back and forth if you wanted mm -hmm. to. Huh? Yeah, great. Yep. All right, let's talk a little bit about managing content on distribution points. Um, if you've used 2012 for a little while, I don't know about you, but I found this a challenge. If, uh, let's say you want to remove content from five distribution points, how many has gone into that GUI and selected each one, hit remove, select another one, hit remove, it's kind of a pain. Same thing for validate and redistribute, right? This is on the, the package properties for a, for a package or application. So I have a couple examples here, some right-click tools, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about those and just briefly talk about how to build those, and I'll send you some links for, uh, for where we can go to learn more about those. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so as I was mentioning, actually, we're actually, I, I've added, I've added, I can't even speak now. I've added to the monitoring tab. I knew something was wrong. Let's go over in monitoring and let's look at distribution status because normally you can't perform any of those types of actions here. So now when I right click, I have a managed content. You can see there's um, a few options here that we've created. Validating content on all targeted DPs for this package or app. Redistributing, removing, or sending to a DP group. Often that, that happens in our environment. We tested it with a test distribution point. Then we want to go back and we've forgotten we haven't sent all the distribution points. Uh, so this is just a quick way, because you're in this screen and you, that's when you realize that you only targeted one. So now let me, from right here, go ahead and target all my, all my DPs with a, with a DP group.
start just briefly with the send to DP groups. And actually, I want to show you a little XML, and we'll talk a little bit about how to get the right click tool in there. We have a few slides in the, uh, in the presentation that are hidden. We figure we wouldn't have time to talk about those today. So definitely download the slides uh, from, the, uh, from the MMS site, and you'll see some links to uh, Matthew Hudson's blog, where he talks about um, how, to, how to create these right click tools. Basically, uh, there's a GUID for every single thing in your console. Once you know the GUID, you can extend your, uh, your admin console by adding an XML file in the right place. So this is an example for managing DP content. And I've created a group. That's why you have kind of a header there for uh, manage content. And then I have several items inside of there. Just want to point out a couple things in here. You can see for the validate content on all distribution points. Let me try to zoom that in a little bit, too. So for validating distribution points, I'm calling PowerShell, and then I'm actually passing the execution policy to be remote signed at this point. That way, I don't have to modify my default configurations for PowerShell. I can still be secure by default anytime anybody else launches PowerShell on the system or, or whatever. But um, when I'm launching it from a right click in the Configuration Manager console, I'm actually going to uh, bypass signing. Obviously, if you can, signing is preferred. Uh, basically, after that, I'm just passing a file name. And then there's a, a couple uh, arguments that come from the Configuration Manager console. And I don't think I can quite see them there. Let me get out of my Zoom. And you'll see over here, we're going to pass it the namespace and the server so we know where we're, where, what server we need to connect to, as well as a package ID. And when we, when we run that PowerShell, um, and I'll show you on the, on the send to DP groups here, um, basically we're going to grab those arguments. Once we have those, we're going to import that module for Configuration Manager. And since we're sending it to DP groups, we obviously have to get all the DP group names. And this is a simple uh, commandlet for running that, get cm distribution point group. All I care about is the name, and you'll see why in uh, just a minute or two. And basically, for this, we actually pop up a little, um, a little information in a PowerShell so, so that the admin can select which DP group they want to send to. If you have a standards in your environment, you could obviously just hard code it in the XML file so that you don't even have to prompt for that. So we prompt asking for a DP group, and I'll show you that in just a minute. It's slightly tricky, not too tricky, but um, you see these start CM content distribution commandlets. There's a different parameter that's required for each type of package, a package, an operating system package, driver package. So we have to have a little bit of a switch statement. We grab a little bit more information whenever we run this uh, on, on a system because there's different types. Just a simple example here. I select send to DP. It takes a couple seconds because as uh, we've shown, we are connecting to the provider. Provider isn't the fastest thing in the world, but it uh, works well and, and works and gets things done. Something else I also want to point out here, we, we talk about connecting to the provider, and that's very important. And everything we're showing, you are connecting through the WMI provider. That's how you still manage all of your writes through Configuration Manager. So anybody that runs these right-click tools are limited to the writes that they've been granted through Configuration Manager. Uh, there's no, no way around that other than, than touching SQL directly, which all of us know we shouldn't be doing. So um, have no fear, but if you've scoped certain things down, if I didn't have the rights to send content to a DP group, obviously my script would fail and I have to add some, some error checking in. But in this example, basically, um, to not have to deal with the GUI, we're just saying select, uh, select a DP group, press enter, and then it'll automatically add that DP group. That's all there is to it. Pretty straightforward, pretty helpful in my opinion. I do want to show you a slight different twist, uh, valid or sorry, redistributing content. This is an example where we still have to go back to the WMI days. I did want to mention WMI uh, in a couple spaces here, and one particular, from MMS 2012, I talked a bit about Configuration Manager and WMI. Definitely go out and check out the, the free uh, videos for that. Um, so if you haven't used WMI Configuration Manager, you'll see some, some helpful uh, hints for how to leverage it with Config Manager. A lot of it is similar. We still need to pass those arguments like we talked about before. We still connect to the provider. We have to do it a little bit different than we did previously. 
And you can see I'm just calling a get WMI object and uh, specifying the SMS distribution point class. Once I get that information, I make sure there's more than one distribution or more than zero distribution points, right? I can't validate or redistribute content unless it's actually on a DP. And this is some of the magic of WMI. I have a method on the SMS distribution point class. I can call refresh now equals true. Actually, that's a property. I shouldn't even say that. It's kind of weird sometimes in uh, WMI. That's a property that I set to true that actually, when I save it with that put command, it triggers the redistribute to occur. I think we'll talk about a method maybe a little bit later. So that's, that's all it really takes to, uh, to redistribute uh, the, the package to all your DPs that are targeted. Let's see. All right, this is a new one I want to talk about as well. So we have this, this new idea of deploying simulations with the new applications, right? We can create an application. You've got all these deployment types. You might have some complexity in what you want to do. Sherry had some great uh, discussions in theory the other day, uh, yesterday, about how maybe you can minimize the number of collections you have by targeting greater numbers in collections and letting your deployment types determine whether things should install or not, or specifically how commands should be run. So you obviously want to test that, and you do that with a simulation. The only thing that's missing with the simulation is that I can't just promote it to production. I have to delete a simulation and then go through the process again to create a new deployment to basically do what I almost did with a simulation. So I just wanted to show um, how, how you can leverage PowerShell command lists to do that. I forget that button. There we go. Thank you. OK, so let's look at our uh, deployments. So you can see I have a simulation, 7-zip. And uh, I'm ready to, to, to deploy that um, to production. You can see from my simulation, three successes. Now I'm just going to do a right click and promote. You also notice another handy right click there that I've added, delete deployment, right? It's always great to test against all systems until you realize you're not testing anymore. So delete is very helpful as well on the monitoring side. So we can hit promote, and we'll show you the code behind this in just a minute. But basically, we get the information on the simulation. Once we have that information, like I mentioned, you can't have the same app targeted to the same collection in the simulation and an actual uh, required deployment. So we get the information on the simulation. We then delete the simulation. And then we create a new one. And then this one, we actually put a little bit of a catch in here, because we do tell you the collection you're targeting, and we tell you how many members are in that collection. Kind of an are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, I'm sure. I probably can't click on it now. Let's go back. Now we'll create the deployment. And we can see now we're required. And like I said, the whoops, I can come in here and I can delete it as well. So let me just show you a couple steps in that, um, in that script. Again, you do extend the console with the right click. It's a different GUID. Uh, the XML is very similar. We capture those arguments like I talked about. Depending on your environment, there's several things you could do in this space, right? Basically, we're, excuse me, we're creating a required deployment, and we're saying it's going to happen today, and it's going to happen at 8 p.m. tonight. You can obviously even pass, pass those command lines or um, you know, surface a, a, a date time picker if you'd like. Once again, we import the module. We make sure we're connected to the right drive. There's a few things that we need between a simulation and an actual deployment. Certain things like the collection uh, name, for example. Uh, so we, we, we pass and we get, I'm oh, sorry, yes, we pass, we have the collection ID, so now we need to get the name, and that's what we're doing by getting the CM device collection. And then we're getting the deployment, and it's a simulation, and it's actually, uh, if you look in the SDK, it'll tell you that a, a deployment of type three is a simulation. So uh, I didn't really show it, but if you right click on a traditional package, for example, um, you would see, the promote to production there as well. Obviously, that doesn't work on packages. It only works on, on 
new applications. So there's no way to really hide that or change that in the GUI with the right clicks that we have today. So basically, we just need to check for that in our code. Once we have that, you saw we display a little bit of information. And really, we only have a couple lines here where we're actually uh, doing the heavy lifting. We remove the, the simulation, like I mentioned, and then we, cr then we run the start CM application deployment. Now, what's great about this is I showed it in our right click, but really, you, could, you can move this into anything, right? If you're using orchestrator or any type of workflow tool or remedy or any of those other four-letter words, right, you can go in and you can actually uh, architect out a pretty quick way from you know from a change control perspective. Once those things have been approved, you could you could automate the deployment. Okay. All right, I have one more. I'm going to show you application requests, uh, kind of automating that process. Uh, I don't know if any of you have used it yet in Configuration Manager, but basically uh, you can target a user for an app, user can request approval if you require it, and then someone has to go into the console and approve it. Once that's done, then the user can go back into the application catalog and install it. That's, that's, that's a nice starting point, right? There are some, um, some third parties that have integrated and added some additional functionality. There's also a... Um, Solution Accelerator, right, that allows you to use Orchestrator as well as a Service Manager. Mm -hmm. And then your company has also provided something as well, right? Yep. Yeah, so it's pretty slick. What I needed for my environment, uh, at least from a proof of concept perspective, I needed to, to have a little more control over who the approvers are or something like that. Um, so this is just an opportunity to demonstrate how we can interact with Configuration Manager and maybe kick off a workflow if we want and then come back and uh, you know, automatically approve something or get it to the right person to do an approval. So let's go to that demo. All right, so real quick, I'm just gonna show the user experience. So I'm on a Windows 8 system here. You can see I got a couple things targeted to the system. I'm actually gonna hit refresh. I'm not exactly sure if that information is correct on the screen there. But we, should, we saw three applications. Uh, they should all require approval. One of them might not show required because I've probably already tested with it. We'll count to five slowly. And uh, once this information appears, uh, I'll, I'll just as an end user, I'll request some new software. Maybe we'll count to 10. All right, great. All right, so 7-zip requires approval. I needed to do my job, right? So I'm going to request it. Well, because I need it to do my job. It's very hard to type a sentence without any typos, so that, that was pretty impressive. Okay, so I requested it, sent it off. I'm gonna minimize my Windows 8 system. And just to show from a roles-based uh, type of scenario, there's a lot more granular we could get, but this is a, uh, this is a user in this console that can only approve applications. You can obviously scope that so they can only approve specific applications if you want to as well. But basically, you can see we have one here, Frank2, that has requested 7-zip. And we can dig in and we can see those comments in here as well as if we'd like. But um, basically, what I'm just gonna show you is um, we can run a PowerShell script on the back end. We're gonna look for any pending requests and then we're gonna start uh, to kick off a couple things. So I'm just gonna kick off this PowerShell And we'll talk about the script here for a minute. Okay, so let me show you the output and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so basically, we got that information on that request and we identified the username, we identified the email by querying Active Directory, and we also got the comments. Then we went into Configuration Manager, and let me flip over here real quick because I didn't show you ahead of time. If I go to my 7-zip application, I very smartly added an owner, and it was actually an email address. You can do anything you wanted here, but this is just the idea that I had. I can put my owner in this in here in any way I want, and then I can use my script to decide what I want to do, right? You could even put manager, and then if you wanted, you could query Active Directory, find out their manager, and start, start the conversation that way. 
right? So basically, like I said, we know the application, we know the user that requested it, um, we queried Active Directory, we got the email account. We basically have everything we have, everything we need now to contact the approver to request them to approve the software. And um, I don't have Exchange configured, so basically I'm just outputting it here to the screen. But um, you can see I've got an approval um, URL and I got a deny a URL. So let me just grab that URL. You can all pretend it's in your email or something. Old school email. And I'll just paste it in. It's not very pretty. I never claim to be pretty. But you can see on the screen, we approved the software. Now we can go back if we really want to, and we could look. And if I hit F5, we should be able to see that it's now approved. So it's pretty simple. We're not doing anything that requires you know, a bunch of stuff bolted on. Basically, it's PowerShell script. Unfortunately, there's one little piece that's, that I haven't identified. I'll say it's missing. Hopefully, somebody can prove me wrong. I don't believe there's a status message that comes back through Configuration Manager when applications are requested. Um, otherwise, you could use status message filter rules, and you could automate this whole thing pretty easy. Otherwise, right now, you're just going to do some type of polling interval to check your site to see if there's any new application requests. Um, but you, as you can see, I mean, that, that was pretty basic. Um, if I look, I think I've got less than 50 lines of code here, and there's a bit of fluff. I'll go ahead and just talk about a couple things here. We talked through a bit of the information. As you can see, a lot of this starts to get redundant, right? We always need to know uh, some, some certain information. Since this isn't a right-click tool, I'm actually hard-coding my server and site code information in here. Depending on where you're running this, if it's running specifically on your primary site, you could even clean that up and, and uh, genericize this even a bit more. But you can see I'm running this commandlet get cm approval request. And I'm looking for current state equals one. And if you look in the SDK, you'll find that current state equals one basically means um, it's, it's impending. I also add a little bit more in here as far as um, if, if, it's a, if it's a new request in the last 100 minutes, for example, and that just kind of comes down to how often you're polling, um, you could take that off completely and just nag the people that need to be approving these things and send them an email every, uh, every so often. Basically, from there, everything is uh, centered off of the request good. This is a unique good that Configuration Manager gives any app request. Once you have that information, uh, the model name, it's, it's kind of a good slash with another strange uh, thing with it, but that's what Configuration Manager basically maps the requested application to the application in Configuration Manager. We get some more information, right? I mentioned we got the username. Uh, we then split that out so we can run the get ad user commandlet. And when we run that, um, we, that's how we get the email address back. And then we actually uh, query configuration manager using the get cm application commandlet. Again, I mentioned that model name. That way we know we're actually getting the, uh, the right application the user requested. And you can see I'm, uh, I'm, I'm passing with an XML parameter because I know that this SDM package XML is actually XML. So once I have that back, I do a little parsing in XML. I pull out the user ID, which that's that application owner that I mentioned. Pulling out a little more information, I can obviously pull out a bit more here, but this is information that I'm building so that I can send it to the, the app owner to give them the, uh, the ability to, to approve. And then you can see I've just built out my URLs for approve and deny. I've got a couple ASP scripts, nothing fancy there. And then just the end of this is, um, you know, I'm building the body of my email message, and then I've, I've rimmed it out for this demonstration. But send mail message is how I can send this out to, to the requester. You could obviously do a lot more things at this point as well, right? You could send it to the requester as well as the owner so that they know that it's in process or whatever. Uh, now, the flip side of that, I'll show it here. So this is my simple ASP. Not much to it. I'll zoom in here a little bit. I always have to ask, anybody have the SMS 2003 recipes book? At least one or two of you, all right, good. I still reference it for stuff like this, okay? So this is great. Uh, I can use ASP, very, very VB script-like, and uh, I can actually, basically when I pass that URL to my ASP page, then I'm gonna run my query, and um, you can see the approval there, right in the middle of the screen. And then just, I displayed a little, something a little simple to the, uh, to, the, to the person that clicked on the link. Obviously, you can, you know, your ASP for deny is very similar. 
And of course, there's a ton more you can do from here, right? As soon as this is approved, you could then send an email off to that person that requested it and tell them it's been approved. So there's a lot of things here that we could do um, that, that really takes that basic app approval to the next level. Okay, remote management. I have received uh, many questions regarding to remote management. Questions like, uh, do I need to install admin console to my admin PC or to my rem uh, management server? Then the answer is no. You only need to enable uh, PowerShell remoting on your primary site server and, and you can use only, for example, invoke command to in, invoke a script block on your remote, remote server or you can actually create a PowerShell session to that server or you can use, for example, PowerShell web access to manage your server through a, a web browser. So you can actually do it from your mobile phone also if you want to do that. And currently we don't have any uh, commandlets for uh, clients, so we still need to use uh, WVMI to to configure certain things. So let's go quickly through the process. Um, in, this, in this example, I'm currently using a new PS session to create the session to my primary site server. And, and here in here, I'm explicitly say that connect to a 32-bit Windows PowerShell, but uh, by default it connects to 64-bit Windows PowerShell. And if the connection is uh, connected, then I can enter to the remote session. And in remote session, I can import the PowerShell module. It will take a moment. So, Kaido, you're running this on a system that doesn't have the Config Manager console installed at all, right? Uh, or theoretically, we can. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, just to make that clear, uh, since you're doing a remote session, we don't need to have the Configuration Manager console installed. Nope, we need because the module is uh, only with the uh, uh, admin console. That's why, he keeps me, that's why I keep them around, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Kaido. So, we are already on uh, CMPR2. So let's change the connection cont context. And let's create uh, one device collection China servers. So we should have now a, a collection called China servers. Yep, we have a collection China servers. And and if the job is done, we can exit and remove the PowerShell session. So that's one of the examples. The second example, I'm, I'm only using the invoke command. I have one script block that I'm executing on remote server called CM primary 2. And let's execute this one. And it should create a collection called Denmark servers. Yep. And I have a collection Denmark servers. That was the second example. And we can also combine the invoke command with the new PS session commandlet. I have the script block. Then I will create the session to CM primary one, which is my uh, uh, second primary site. And then I'm using a invoke command to invoke this script block on that remote session. And let's check the primary one. I think we saw an error there on the other uh, screen. 
So you got the pipeline and not in a closed state or in a closed state. Yep. It's. Yep. It's here. Not it. Okay. I have to zoom it. Okay. So, and then last example. I'm using uh, PowerShell web access from my administrator PC. The web interface uh, looks like this. And if I type my credentials, CMBR1, and I need to configure the configuration name also. So you had in the, the 32 because we need to be in that 32 bit mm -hmm. space, right? Okay. And eventually it will show the PowerShell web console, right? Yep. Okay. There yep. We and we are connected. I can see the, the C drive and I will import my script library. Let's create the one uh, user collection. New CM user collection name test users limiting collection name all users. Yep, and we should have collection on primary one, test users. Okay, great. All right, I want to mention a couple other things, some quirks, nuggets, other things about configuration manager and uh, scripting that you might want to be aware of. Depending on what you're doing with PowerShell and Configuration Manager or WMI and Config Manager, you may never run into these, but I just have an example here on the next slide I just want to talk about for a minute. So I, I have a link to talk, it'll give you a little more information about lazy properties and bitwise. So um, I encourage you to download the, the, the presentation like I mentioned. So there's two examples. You can see the one on the left and one on the right. One is using WMI, the other one is using the PowerShell commandlets. Basically what we're doing in both of these is we're getting all the programs for all packages in Configuration Manager. Once we have those, we're enumerating them. And you can see, going on the wrong screen. You can see here, I don't know that we have, yeah, we can, great. So with a lazy property, and I have a definition in the hidden slides, basically, when you do a query against Configuration Manager, if a, if a property is marked lazy, you actually don't receive that information back. Kind of like if you do a select star, it's kind of weird, but you might receive a false back when the actual value is true. So you have to be aware of properties that are lazy or not, and you can look at the Configuration Manager SDK for that. Program flags is an example of lazy property. And program flags is kind of a strange one because it's a, it's a hex number uh, binary number that actually has a, a lot of different settings within it. And uh, the only way to get to that information is once we have a program, we can do a direct call and you can see the WMI in brackets and we're actually calling to get that specific uh, program. Once we have that, we do this binary and to see if this program flags is set to allow um, suppressing of notifications to end users. If it's already set, then we just do nothing and we loop to the next program. If it's not suppressed, so if, this, if the setting is not set to true at this point, basically we list the information to the screen and you can see we're doing a binary or, which are also fun, and uh, we're passing it the specific program flag. 
And as, as with all things in WMI, once you make that setting change, you need to do the put so that you save that information back to Configuration Manager. Um, this is a slow process because we're querying kind of twice, right? We query for all programs, and then we have to use this specific get with this WMI accelerator to pull back all properties, including the lazy properties. Just important to, to know that. If you're ever doing anything in the console, it, it doesn't look like what you're seeing when you query. Go back and look at the SDK. If you just search for, and when you're, especially when you're dealing with WMI, if you just search for SMS underscore program and look in the, in the information for SMS program on MSDN for lazy, you'll find some, some of those properties. You'll find all of those properties that are lazy. So this is the example with using um, get CM program, the commandlet. Now, we still have the same challenge because when I do that get CM program, it doesn't list out each one of those properties separately. You have a program fl flags value. And I caution you, if you just grab that program flags value and you set one value equal to another one, you're modifying a lot more settings than the one you think you are, right? Because there's several program settings that are affected by this program flag. So it would be very rare or uncommon for you to have all program flags set the same across every program you have. That's uh, interesting with uh, anything you do in scripting, right? You can uh, do things really fast, and you also have the opportunity to shoot yourself in the foot really, really fast. So be sure that you're careful with those things. So we are still doing the, the check with the binary and. That, like I said, that doesn't go away. This is a little different when we do the set CM program. Um, there is a uh, parameter, suppress program notifications true. So you can just set this when you're, well, you can even set this when you're creating a program. But this is how you modify a program using the commandlets. So you might think, well, why don't I just loop all my programs and run this commandlet against all of my programs? you're gonna cause a bit of overhead, and if you're changing, for example, 500 of them all of a sudden, that's 500 new policies that are generated for every system you're targeting. It's kind of a waterfall effect, so just keep that in mind if you're you know, running scripts to change things on, on systems. Um, by doing it this way, you're, you're looking to see which, system, which items need to be changed first. Craig, is, it, is, a, there, is there a difference using a WVMI directly or building commandlets for oh. performance? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so performance is interesting. I don't know if you've used get CM program on, uh, let's say you have a thousand programs. If you run get CM program and you don't give it any parameters for the ID, just like I have here, just get CM program, you'll see that it takes a very long time to get that information back. When I say very long, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, coffee break minutes, right? It takes a long time because when you run get CM program, it is actually doing that explicit call so that you get the lazy properties back. If you don't need the lazy properties, you know, say for example, you just want to look at the command line, which is not a lazy property, you could use WMI instead and you'll get that same result back in, you know, 20 seconds or something like that. So just depending on what you're doing, uh, depending on how fast things need to be, that might be a reason why you might want to use WMI. All right, so we've talked a bit about commandlets and WMI and when you may want to use one or the other. We just wanted to point out a couple of things that uh, in our books, these are things that uh, we'd like to see be commandlets. Uh, I think Kaido's probably filed a bug for every single one that uh, we'd like to see have commandlets. Right, maintenance windows is one that uh, still requires WMI. Yep, we yeah. still need to use WMI to create the maintenance windows and console folders, which is also quite important. And we can create the different structures in, in our admin console. And, and then like we talked about, the content management as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's still some things out there that uh, you just won't see um, commandless for at this point. So just keep that in mind. OK, so we, we set aside a, a little demo slide here. I don't know if we've got time you want to talk uh, about collections. Or I'm sorry, it wasn't collections. It, uh, it's uh, do you have the folders, right? Yep. All right, let's do that. Uh, I have one uh, custom browser script that creates uh, six different folders. And it creates a lot of different uh, collections. And uh, I have a parameter folder, so it moves uh, collection to a correct folder. So 
currently I don't have any any folders uh, in my on my console. So if I execute the script, oh, wrong location. So it will take a moment to run. And if I check my console, then I see that I have already five folders. And it's still running. And, and I have already two collections under my software updates. And we currently, currently we can't do this with built-in commandlets. Right, still have to touch the view map yep. for that, right? Okay. Yep. We are, we, so let's see. St still running. Okay. All right, let me show you a couple other things while that's running. Just a couple other things I wanted to point out. Um, a lot of times it's kind of hard to figure out the, the commandlet that you might need to run. Uh, Jeffrey Snover likes to say, think, type, do. That's the whole goal of PowerShell. We're getting there. Uh, a lot of commandlets, depending on who builds them from different companies and things like that, may not follow the, the verb noun form. Um, the, the configuration manager ones have done, have done pretty well, but there's a lot of them, and um, there's some, I don't know, similarities between a lot of them. So I just want to show you this command. Get dash command, I specified the module configuration manager, and then I'm going to throw it to a grid view. This is where I always go whenever I'm trying to figure out what command line I need to look at. And I'll zoom in here real quick. Our grid view is wonderful. You can do that on just about anything. So once I have this information here, I can then go up into filter, and let's say I want to look for approval. All right, so now I've suddenly narrowed, narrowed down my list. To, uh, to get an idea of, of all the different commandlets that are available for approval. So once I have that, then I'll go out to uh, TechNet and, uh, and I'll find some documentation. Um, just to take this a little bit further, let me get out of this. And I'm just going to do this on the fly here. So I'm going to say approve CM approval request. If I do a get help, approve CM approval request. When I type this, you might get enough information right here to get you rolling, right? You can actually see the parameter set, application name, user. You see that information there. Um, depends on your commandlets. You might be able to do a dash fool on the end of it. And you might see, see, see some additional information. And you get a, maybe a little bit more here. Yeah. So there's a bit of information there. One other thing I'll show you real quick. It's talking about those right-click tools and um, how to identify those nodes. And um, again, I, I, I referenced a link where you can download this. But basically, Matthew Hudson has created um, basically a, a folder structure that has all of the possible right-click nodes that you could have. So a quick way to cheat on your test admin console is you copy them and you paste them into this uh, extensions actions directory. Once you have them there, let me close my admin console. And I'll reopen that admin console. Does require, it does require a close and, and reopen. Now you'll see I can go anywhere in the admin console now, and I can see the GUID. So that helps me figure out where I need to drop my XML file. Now there's a lot more to it, right? I mean, there's different parameters for different, different objects and things like that but at least gives you a nice uh, leap to help you figure out where you need to go to, uh, to get those, those nodes, to get, to get the right-click action. So that's pretty handy. Again, it's hidden in the uh, slides. Um, do you have anything else you want to show, or are we good? I think that. Good there? Okay, yep. great. Okay, Kaido has a great blog, lots of Configuration Manager SDK information. I've got a little bit of Configuration Manager SDK information. And you also see our, um, our um, 
Twitter handles there as well. Um, I think anytime I post, it automatically throws a little tweet out there so you can kind of see how active I am or not active. But um, there's some good info out there. All the uh, sample right clicks, I'll post those. The one for the application approval, I'll probably take a little bit longer because I just need to clean that up and make sure it's documented a little bit. But uh, definitely take a look at our, at our web links. You'll find a lot of good information there. We're, we're always open for questions, things that you're looking for as well. We'll try to address those. Mm -hmm. As always, please fill out your valuations. We uh, want to make sure that uh, we're giving you the right content you're looking for. Definitely send that information back to us. Everything that's done here at MMS is recorded, so be sure you go out to Channel 9, get those, uh, those recordings. And as well as I mentioned, you can go back into Schedule Builder and start down downloading those PowerPoint presentations. So at this time, I think we're ready for questions. Yep. Yep. Thank you. If Thank anybody you. wants to use the mic, feel free. Otherwise, uh, if anybody wants to come up, we'll, we'll handle them that way. So the question was, we have examples for creating, but not necessarily for populating. So you're looking for examples of how to add a query, for example, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have any Kaido. We can definitely put mm -hmm. that on the list, and we'll generate those. So basically, it's a matter of using the WQL to, uh, you know, and that's basically a, a command line parameter that you would state. Um, but I don't know that I have one out there now, but this is a good one. We'll add that. Mm -hmm. That was it. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Two class.